Well, we've been talking about it for a long time. It's time we really focused in on the issue of valuing transaction targets. So we're now at section nine. The objectives of this section are to identify three different types of prices and values, to review a range of different methods for doing valuation analysis. We're gonna look at asset-based approaches, we're gonna do current multiples, transaction multiples, and then of course, the discounted cash flow, DCF approach. We're going to also understand why DCF is usually the best method for valuing companies and then discuss three things you need to do to get DCF valuation right. You need to define your operating cash flows correctly, you need to choose an appropriate forecast period, and you need to calculate residual value. So we'll talk about all those components. So we're now moving on to question number five, which is what might the company be worth to us and to other potential buyers? And so we're going to look at the DCF valuation and multiples approaches. So early on, we put in front of you the core principle behind this program, which is to find the highest value dues for all assets. And we showed how that means if there's something that's worth more to you than it is to others, those are things that you focus on buying. And if there's things that are worth more to others than they are to you, those are things that you divest or avoid buying. We also defined our key terms of price and value. Price is what you have to pay to buy something. Value is what it's worth to you. And we've illustrated how important that is because value creation is defined as the difference between value and price. So that means to determine whether you're going to walk away from a transaction with value, you have to do two calculations, not one. You have to answer what's it worth to us, the value question, and then what price might we have to pay to buy it? The pricing question. So I promised we'd cover the approaches and this is the section where we do exactly that. So at a top level, you just have to say, there's a whole range of different prices and values. On the price side, you've got a current stock price. If it's in a transaction, there's maybe an offer that you've made, an offer price. There's offers that others make, there's a maximum price that you would pay, there's a maximum price that others would pay, and then there's a closing price to a transaction. Simple question, are all those the same number or are they different? They're different, right? And that's just the price side. Let's look at the value side. On the value side, there's something called breakup value, the value of a company if you split it up into its components. There's asset value, there's market value, there's shareholder value, there's standalone value, there's value with synergies, and then there's the value to you, and then there's the value to other potential bidders. Same question, are all those the same number? No, they're different, right? So here's the point. If you're not really clear at the beginning, what are you trying to calculate here? Are you calculating a price or a value? And if so, which type of price and value? If you're not clear about that, the odds of selecting the right model and putting the right inputs in it to get a reasonable answer are actually very low. So what we need to start is with these broad notions of pricing and value. So I like to cover this in terms of what I call the value spectrum. And over at one end of the spectrum, you can think of what I call breakup value. Again, this is the value of a business if you ceased and desisted, stopped all operations, sold off all the assets, retired the liabilities, and you know, took what's left over to the bank. This is also sometimes known as liquidation value. And again, it assumes that the best thing for the company to do is to cease its operations. So that's breakup value at one end of the spectrum. So are companies ever worth more than their breakup numbers? Let's hope so, right? Because <laughs> anytime a company is worth more alive than dead, um, it's gonna have a value that's higher than its breakup value. So we're talking about a different notion of value then. I like to call this a current value number. For in transactions, we also call this the standalone value, the value of the business, the way it is right now under its current strategy. And it assumes that the best strategy for the business is its current strategy. And so you can see we've kind of written the word strategy between breakup and current because strategy is the only thing that causes a company to be worth more alive than dead, right? If it's got a good strategy, it's worth more alive. So that's why we spent so much time focusing on strategies because that's what's really creating the value. 
But notice, if you're valuing a company that way, it's a going concern, right? It's not dead, you're not selling it off, and you have to say, well, okay, what's it worth now under its current strategy? But now let's ask another question. Are companies ever worth more than they are under their current strategies? And of course, the answer is yes, right? That's the reason we're all here. We're here because we're trying to identify acquisitions that could make targets worth even more than their standalone values, than their current values. So to get from current values to acquisition values, you have to add synergies. So acquisition value is also known as value with synergies, and therefore those values include the synergies that could be created in combination with another business. So do you see, this is another notion of value. We start out with breakup value, then we add the value of strategies to get to current value, then you add the value of synergies to get to what we call acquisition value. Make sense? So, quick question, of those three types of numbers, breakup, current, and acquisition, which is the right number for any given company? I'm actually looking for a two-word answer. Got it? The answer is, the highest, right? Let's go back to our principle, the highest valued use for all assets. What's the highest valued use? You know, for some businesses, it may be the case that the best thing to do is to cease and desist and just stop the, the business. If that's true, the right number for that company is the breakup number. On the other hand, some businesses are being run really well right as they are today. So for example, let me choose Apple right now. I don't know about you, but I don't have any great ideas about how to make Apple worth a huge amount more than it already is. It's doing a pretty good job. Well, if that's true, then you're saying that its current value, its current strategy is the highest. So that would be the right number for Apple, its current value. But then again, the reason we're taking this whole program is because for many companies, it's true that their current value could be improved. They could either be improved by combining the company with another and creating some synergies, or more generally, you could choose an even better strategy to get to an optimal value for the company. So we, we have to look at all three of these notions. But here's the point. If you're not clear which one of these you're, you're focusing on, your odds of choosing the right model and again putting the right inputs to that model to get a reasonable answer is really quite small. So. There's many different methods that you can use to calculate prices and values. The net asset approach is what you use to calculate a breakup value. We'll show you an example of that. Current multiples gives you a current number for a company. Turns out it's a price, not a value. Transaction multiples gives you a synergistic number for a company, and DCF standalone gives you a current number, and DCF with synergies gives you a synergistic number for a company. So let me give you some examples of all of these and show you how it's done. So applying all these to um, our pals at Gleason Breweries, here's what we get. You know, when you're doing asset valuation, again, it's really just what are the assets worth, what would it cost to retire all the liabilities, the net of those two is what you can take home to the bank. And of course, you'd prefer to use market values rather than book values because the book values can be old and out of date and, and not bear a lot of resemblance to what you could actually get. So again, market value is better, but the calculation is really quite simple. And we see it here for Gleason, and it, we come up with a value of um, 468, almost $469 million if you take their assets minus liabilities. So very, very straightforward analysis. But again, that gives you a breakup number. So is Gleason worth more than potentially breaking up? I strongly suspect that it is. And let's, let's explore that further. So now let's move to current multiples analysis. What current multiples analysis does is it says, well, let's take some multiples for publicly traded companies, whether it's price to earnings, price to sales, price to cash flow, market price to book price, those common ratios. And it comes up with that ratio for a group of peers. And then it says, well, okay, let's assume that those ratios are appropriate for Gleason as well. 
And notice if we apply those to um, Gleason, as we've done in this analysis here, we end up with a much higher number. My goodness, you know, we're looking at, you know, 970 million, you know, versus the 650 we had on the last page. So we shouldn't be surprised that a current multiples analysis gives us a higher number than an asset number because an, an asset-based valuation assumes the company's dead and it's worth more alive than dead. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's higher. We might be surprised that it's as much higher as it seems to be here. The, you know, what's great about current multiples analysis is it's pretty easy to do, right? You just look at current publicly traded companies, you calculate the ratios, you weight those ratios and apply them to the company at hand. But you also have to make sure, well, hold it, do those ratios really apply um, to this company? Is this company like those other companies? Again, these are the publicly quoted peers. They're not the craft brewers, so they don't fit particularly well. So there's some problems with current multiples analysis, and although they seem like they're very, um, they're very objective measures, they're actually quite subjective. It depends a lot which companies you include as peers and how you weight them. So be a little careful about current multiples analysis. But if what you're looking for is a quick indication and you say, oh, okay, if on average this thing is, has numbers that are consistent with the numbers you see in publicly traded peer companies, it's a quick analysis and easy to do. And by the way, it always comes up in negotiations. What's the multiples price? So you got to do the number. So here it is current multiples. And do you see that as long as the numbers you use for publicly quoted peers is their current stock price as a function of sales, current stock price as a function of earnings, a function of cash flow, a function of market and book values, do you see that what you're going to get as a current number for, in this case, Gleason? So that's what current multiples analysis is. By the way, this comes directly out of the Corporate Transformation Partners M&A Valuation Toolkit. All of this calculation, it's actually trivial stuff. All you have to do is kind of put in the numbers that are in blue for a company and it'll automatically spit this stuff out for you. So the calculation is actually pretty easy, which is both good and bad <laughs> because you got to make sure, hold it, is all this making sense? And again, the core issues here are, do these peers really represent the company that we're trying to model? And also, have we included the right companies as peers? So it's also true that not all multiples are created equal. You know, if I were to give you a price to earnings ratio and a an EBIT multiple or an EBITDA multiple or a multiple of sales, you know, which one would you prefer? And the quick thinking is this, a price to sales ratio implicitly assumes that everything that happens in the cost structure after sales is the same across the peers. So it doesn't, there's not as much information, if you will, in a price to sales ratio as there is in a price to earnings ratio, because earnings also takes into account the cost structure. But then if I were to give you a price to cash flow ratio versus a price to earnings ratio, Again, the price to cash flow ratio gives you more information. Cash flow also includes the investments that have been made in fixed and working capital. So whereas earnings assumes that that investment is equal across all the peers, a price to cash flow ratio will tease all that out over time. So again, not all multiples are created equal. You know, so some, some give you more information than others, and ideally you'd like to have as much information in the number as possible. Unfortunately, sometimes that does that you just don't have an option. So for example, if you're dealing with an early stage company where they have revenues but don't yet have solid earnings data, you're kind of stuck with just using a price to sales ratio. So anyway, you do the best you can. So as we've discussed, comparable multiples analysis have significant drawbacks that limit their application. It's difficult to find good peer companies. And by assuming that the value drivers are similar across the peer companies, comparable multiple analysis kind of average away the very distinctions that we've said matter most. For example, if your company is only worth the average multiple, do you see that you've just ignored any unique synergies that might happen? Right? There's no synergies at all, and you're just averaging everything together. So that, that's a big issue with respect to multiples.
Um, again, the, the ratios are often not comparable across companies over border lines or across international um, borders. And also, comparable multiples analysis typically uses public company data to calculate the value to current owners and uses specific private company issues that could be different that um, would be different from a public company. It's also difficult to estimate how multiple um, how multiples should change as a result of a changes in an operating strategy. Right? A lot of what we want to do is say, well, hold it, if we change this business this way by adding this synergy or that synergy, it's really hard to say, well, what would happen to your multiple if you got a, got a synergy? I, I don't even know how you'd answer that question other than perhaps to go back and use DCF and then back solve for what the change in the multiple might have to be. So comparable multiples, multiples is good, but it doesn't get us all the way there. Transaction multiples are a little bit closer, at least in one important regard. Transaction multiples are different than current multiples. Instead of using a current stock price as a function of sales, a current stock price as a function of earnings or cash flow or, or book value, it uses a price at which a deal actually closed. So here, we're not looking at current stock prices, we're looking at deal prices. And because deal prices include the synergies that you would expect in the deal, at least the common synergies, you would generally expect that transaction multiples come up with a higher number than current multiples. And so let's take a look at what we have here. And again, this is another model. It's in the valuation toolkit, easy for you to use. You simply enter what are historical transactions. You put the prices at which those transactions closed. You put the debt in so that you can be clear about corporate value versus equity value. And then enter sales, earnings, cash flow, book value, etc. as you have it, and it'll automatically calculate the ratios for you. Um, so what's good about this is it absolutely incorporates the, more of the synergies of the deal. So at least you're talking about the right type of a number. You're talking about an acquisition type of number versus a current number. So that's good. But many of the same issues apply. One, well, hold it, do these transactions really warrant the, the, the same sort of premiums as might be warranted for this transaction? You know, as we've said, it's unique synergies that are driving a deal, so this approach also assumes away all of the things that matter most, the uniqueness of each specific deal. Um, as with current multiples, though, there's always a conversation around, well, you know, if I happen to be the buyer, I'm going to choose whatever multiple ends up giving me the lowest shown value here on transaction multiples. And of course, if I'm the seller, just the opposite. I'm going to choose whatever multiple seems to give me the highest number and argue vehemently why that's the right multiple to use. So again, games are played around transaction multiples. But just so you understand what they are, they can be a quick indication of the price, how much you might have to pay to buy a company. Um, so, for all of these reasons, DCF is the appropriate valuation method for most firms. DCF is driven by the factors that we've shown truly drive stock prices over time, cash flows over the long term, and risk. And it can be used to estimate either current value or synergistic value. You can use the expected cash flows under the current strategy to calculate a current value, but then if you discount synergistic cash flows, you end up with a synergistic value. So you get two different numbers depending upon what inputs you put in. DCF also, really importantly, yields the value of the business, not just its price. Notice, comparable multiples, comparable transactions, all of those give you prices not values, they're the prices at which past deals were done, or the prices at which current, current companies trade. It's not the value, what you could get today. And also, very importantly, by using expected cash flows, DCF can link s value to changes in strategy. Otherwise, you can, you, or with this, you can evaluate specific synergies. Again, you just can't do that using a multiples approach. So because investors determine value based on cash flow, long-term horizon, and risk, DCF is the most academically pure approach to valuation. And for our purposes, you can, it is the only model that really can be used to link decisions
all the way through to their impacts on value. So we use it for good reason. And here's an overview of the DCF model, which we're, which we're using. It's baked into our toolkit, and it's a very standard approach. You know, I hope you look at this and you go, oh, okay, that's kind of what I thought. Our attempt here is not at all to come up with a new and fancy type of DCF that you've never heard of. Quite the contrary. We want to keep a pure, vanilla, simple, but academically rigorous and practically appropriate model for using DCF analysis. So that's what this is intended to be. So let's talk through the model in a little bit of detail here. The basic idea is you've got four big components of value. First is the, is the first blue box. It's the cumulative present value of cash flows throughout the forecast period. So you choose some forecast period. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then you forecast the cash flows to come from either the current strategy or to come from the, the acquisition, including the synergies. So you forecast those cash flows going forward, but because those cash flows occur out into the future, you have to take their present values to come back to what they're worth today. So again, the first box is the present value of cash flows throughout the forecast period. But then it's usually true that companies are still worth quite a lot at the end of the forecast period. Whatever they're worth, let's just call that residual value. It's whatever the company is worth at the end of the forecast period. But that's the value at the end of the forecast period. So if you want to figure out what that's worth today, you have to take the present value of the residual value also by discounting the residual value by the cost of capital times, you know, plus one plus the cost of capital to the power of the number of years into the future. And that's your second box of value. So if you've got the first box, your present value of cash flows through the forecast period, and second, the present value of the residual value, whatever it's worth at the end of that forecast period, Together, those two represent the full operating value of the company, right? But now let's go to the third blue box. Isn't it true that companies often have assets that really aren't part of the operations, but still they're worth something? And if they are, shareholders absolutely have a claim against those assets. We call those non-operating assets. They have value, but they're not part of the operations. And so if you add the non-operating assets to the operating value of the business from the first two blue boxes, that gives you the overall enterprise value. So think of that as the whole pizza. This is what the whole thing is worth. But then, before shareholders get their slices, you have to subtract off the, the claims of anybody that stands in line before them. And primary among those people would be the debt holders. Debt holders have a prior claim on the assets of the, of the firm. They've got a piece of paper that says, I'm going to get paid my interest and return my principal according to this contract, this debt contract I have here. So that's a prior claim to what shareholders have. Shareholders have kind of whatever's left over after those contracts are fully, fully um, met and resolved. So in order to calculate shareholder value, you have to subtract the market value of debt and any other obligations. So. That's it. Again, I hope you look at this model and you go, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's just like the DCF I've always used, right? Um, this is exactly the model that we use, not only in teaching DCF, but actually this is the model we use, I have used multiple times, and I've seen many companies use around the globe for doing detailed high-level valuations of multi-billion dollar targets. So this, this model is great from all perspectives. So let's talk about if you're going to do this model, you know, how do you do it correctly? First, let's talk about cash flows. Free operating cash flows are the after-tax cash flows from operations that are free to be paid back to equity and debt holders. So investors base their assessment of value on the cash flows that they might ultimately receive. And they receive these cash flows either directly through dividends or indirectly, if the cash flow is reinvested in the company, what they ultimately get then is capital gains. Free cash flows are much less subject to distortions from accounting conventions than things like earnings. And also, free cash flows cannot be disturbed by financing transactions, for example, issuing debt. So we really want to make sure that we do not include things like interest expense and other things that would change as a function of financing. Now, interest expenses, absolutely, it's cash out the door, but 
it's not for operations, it's for financing. We're going to take care of the financing by using a weighted average cost of capital, which we'll talk about in our risk section. Um, also, most managers find working with cash flows pretty straightforward, right? When sales come in the door, that's, a pretty, that's obviously a good thing, right? That's positive in terms of cash flow. When expenses go out the door, that's negative in terms of cash flow. Taxes, cash out the door to the government. That's cash out the door. Also, when you sink cash into fixed and working capital, that's not available to pay back to shareholders. Absolutely makes sense that that would have a negative impact on cash flows. So, free operating cash flows is sometimes called free cash flow or operating cash flow or just plain old cash flow as we'll refer to it. But it's not the same as operating cash flow on the cash flow statement. Those of you with accounting backgrounds might know that on the cash flow statement, they don't include fixed and working capital investments in operating cash flow. However, from an economic standpoint, we are absolutely including them here. So, free operating cash flows can be characterized by just five basic value drivers. If you give me historical sales, and then you give me the value driver sales growth, which we characterize as the letter G, I can then tell you, all right, well, here's what sales growth was, here's what sales was, and here's, given the growth, here's what sales growth is going to be out into the future. Then if you tell me, well, what percentage of sales is operating profit margin, I can then also characterize what operating profit margins are going forward. Then you tell me what percentage of operating profit margin is utilized to pay taxes, and then I can give you a cash tax rate and calculate the cash taxes going forward. Then, two other investment statistics. If you tell me how much you had to invest in fixed and working capital to grow sales, then you can characterize that going forward. So those last two we call incremental fixed capital investment and incremental working capital investment. And the way to calculate them is pretty straightforward. What you do is you look at how much was sunk into fixed and working capital in each period, but then you, div you divide that by the change in sales between the periods. And what you end up with is a percentage. So for example, if that percentage is 10%, what that means is, for every dollar of sales growth between those two years, you had to put 10 cents into fixed capital. So if you can characterize just those five value drivers, you can characterize cash flows going forward. And so on the next page, we've got definitions that are more detailed around each one of these value drivers, but they're really quite straightforward and defined just the way I've just mentioned. So, Here's also an example of calculating those historical value drivers for Gleason breweries. We simply enter the historical data, and by the way, all of this is also within the Valuation Toolkit. If you go to the Value Drivers page, you'll see all this information in there already. Also, once you've got the value drivers, you can see how they can be used to calculate operating cash flows going forward. And it's exactly the process I just described to you. Take historical sales, grow it by G, the sales growth rate, then take a percentage of that as operating profit, pull off a percentage of that for taxes, gives you net operating profit after tax, what we call NOPAT, and then subtract off the investments in fixed and working capital. Take those percentages and multiply them by the change in sales in each year, and that's the amount that was actually sunk into fixed and working capital. And because that's sunk into those things, that's cash that's not available to pay back to shareholders, so you should subtract it in defining operating cash flow. So that's what you see in this chart here. The toolkit even goes one step further. Once you've got the cash flows going for, forward, then you simply add the cost to capital and it can discount those cash flows to their cumulative present values. And then finally, we have our first blue box, the present value of cash flows throughout a forecast period. So let's move on then. Now let's focus on the related issues of forecast period and residual value. So now we're talking about our second blue box. It's important to note that the value of cash flows more than five years into the future is often more than half of the value of most companies. Here we've got an example of fast food companies where the number is even larger. It's more like, you know, 80% of the value is five and further years out into the future. 
So what that says is if you were to value these companies based solely on five years of cash flow forecast, you'd be estimating the value that's you know, 20% or less of what the true value of the company is. So that's a huge misstatement in value. And this is actually other strong evidence that investors really go out into the long term in determining the value of companies. So what we need to do is think about using the residual value approach that best reflects whatever the economics are of the company at the end of the forecast period. One very simple assumption, it's not too common, but one very simple assumption is at the end of the forecast period, maybe you're just going to sell the business cease and desist, sell off the assets for their market values, retire the liabilities. Well, if that's what you're really going to do with the business at the end of the forecast period, it's pretty clear that the right approach to calculating residual value is to just use a net asset valuation approach at that time. But again, that's a rather unusual assumption. Let's use another economic assumption. Let's say that maybe you're going to sell the company at the current average premium. Okay. Um, so if you had a contract that said we're really going to do that and you could define what that premium is right now, okay, do it, right? Go to the end of the forecast period, find out what the earnings or cash flow or sales are and apply the multiple, the transaction multiple to include the synergies and then say, okay, well, that's the number we're going to get at the end of the forecast period. That would be your residual value. But again, that's a pretty unusual situation. Very, very rarely would you say, all right, in five years, I'm going to sell the company for exactly this number. So what we'd like to do is to be able to come up with an assumption for ongoing entities. And to do that, we have to rely on some kind of an economic assumption. And there's kind of two core assumptions you could make. One of them is far more, I'll say, rational, common, and appropriate than the other. One assumption is to say, Look, let's forecast for a period of time over which we think the current strategy could create value. The company could earn over its cost of capital. But then after that period of time, let's simply assume that all new investments return the cost of capital. And there's a lot of reason to believe that most companies would behave this way, right? Because as we've seen, when, when, com when companies have a good idea, they earn over their cost of capital, but then over time, Companies tend to enter the industry, they tend to compete away the return so that it comes down to the cost of capital. So that may be a reasonable assumption for many. But that's not the only assumption. Let me give you another assumption. Another assumption, this is far more bold, would be that the company is going to be creating value indefinitely into the future. And if that's true, you might use a residual value approach, which we call perpetuity with growth. Let me show you what that last one looks like. You know, if you're looking to value a series of cash flows that are growing out into the future, some of you may remember from your, your, your high school algebra, you know, what is the limit of a geometric series? Well, the limit of the geometric series of cash flows growing at a rate g indefinitely into the future and discounted by 1 plus the cost of capital to the power of the number of years into the future, the sum of all of those comes closer and closer to cash flow over k minus g the more terms you add. So that's the general equation. And so this holds true for all values of, of cash flow K and G. But that doesn't mean that all values of cash flow K and G result in meaningful representations of business values. Take a look at the chart down at the bottom. What it shows is that there's a real problem here. As G approaches K, so as the growth rate in cash flows approaches the cost of capital, the denominator in this approaches zero, and so the quotient approaches infinity. So you got to be really, really careful about how you choose your G, because if you choose too high a G, you can make it look like there's infinite value here and wildly distort what the value of the company is. So let's go back to the economic assumption I talked about. This is the most common assumption, that all fixed capital investments in excess of whatever is necessary just to sustain the current level of NOPAT, after the forecast period are going to return the cost of capital. So basically, if you start with the cash flow over K minus G equation and then insert this one relationship that all of the investments you made in going from, cash, from NOPAT to cash flow return the cost of capital, cash flow over K minus G actually turns into 
no pat over K. And that's the residual value approach that we will propose is the most common one to use, and that's the standard approach that you can use in, in the valuation toolkit that we've given you. Of course, you can specify other approaches. You can enter any number you want for residual value, but the default is, is the no pat over k approach to residual value. And again, it's based on this very reasonable assumption that given a new strategy, given investments today, you choose a forecast period that's long enough for those investments to pay out. And as long as you've captured the value creation from that payout, at the end of the forecast period, it's reasonable to assume that returns go back down to the cost of capital. Now, some people might say, well, hold it, that's a kind of pessimistic assumption. But remember, there's no promise at all that just because you're in business means you're going to earn over your cost of capital. In fact, there's quite a number of public companies right now who would be delighted to be earning their cost of capital. So I think it's pretty hard to argue that that's too pessimistic an assumption. So, in the NOPAT perpetuity method, incremental fixed and working capital are not subtracted because, as we said here, th those investments are assumed to be value neutral. So, it would be wrong to subtract investments in fixed and working capital to grow the value and then simultaneously assume that there's no value creation. So again, instead of using cash flow over K or K minus G, we use just NOPAT. And that, that, again, this is the formula that is the default in our toolkit and the one that we're going to be using in our exercises, etc. So the key to residual value is to make sure that you match the investment assumption in the numerator with the growth assumption in the denominator. In the general equation of cash flow over K minus G, you're basically assuming that um, you're making investments in fixed and working capital in order to cause some level of growth, G, into the future. Under no pad over K, aside from the depreciation, or what we also call economic depletion, that's naturally included in no pad. Because remember, in order to get to no pad, you have to subtract depreciation. So that's already in there. Aside from that, you don't subtract any investments in fixed and working capital, and then you don't assume any growth. So you've been internally consistent with how you're doing that. You know, if you want to, you can even set these two equal to each other, right? Because they have to be. For some number g, it has to be true that cash flow over k minus g equals no pad over k. And then you can back solve and say, well, hold it. You know, if g is greater than g star, you're basically assuming that value is created in perpetuity. And if G is less than G star, you're basically assuming that value is destroyed in perpetuity. So if you happen to be across the table from somebody who's using a cash flow over K minus G approach, I actually encourage you to do this. This builds a bridge between the two approaches. And if you do this work and it, it turns out that there's, they're using a growth rate that's higher than this G star, again, which is the rate of growth you would get assuming that all new investments return only the cost of capital, then you can ask them, okay, well, what benefit does this company have that's going to allow it to earn over its cost of capital in perpetuity? And the answer to that is usually something like, I, I don't know. I didn't know I was realizing. I was, I was assuming that. But implicitly, that's what they're assuming if they choose the wrong G. So anyway, that's that. So if you're going to use a NOPAT perpetuity approach for residual value, then it's important to choose a forecast period that's at least long enough to incorporate the value creation that would come from the investments within the forecast period. As a practical matter, most companies use five or ten year forecast periods, but again, it could need to be longer if it's a very long-term strategy that's going to take a long time to pay out. It might also be really short if it's a short-term strategy and the investments will yield their returns quickly. If you want to, you can also check the profile of future economic profits because what they will show you is is economic profit actually approaching zero after the forecast period because that's exactly what happens when the returns equal the cost of capital. So if you want to make sure that you're being internally consistent and capturing all the value growth just do an economic profit forecast and it'll show you what the, the what the expected returns are year by year out into the forecast. So, here's the example of residual value for Gleason Breweries. We've again taken NOPAT over K, 
and then we've taken the present value of that. That's the, the notepad over k is the value at the end of the forecast period. You then have to bring that back to today by dividing it by 1 plus the cost of capital to the power of the number of years in the forecast. So that's our second box, the present value of residual value. But then and again, in addition to the present value of cash flows during the forecast period and the present value of residual value, you have to add non-operating assets. And these, as we said, are anything that has value that's not represented in future cash flows. It's valued on a market present value basis. And examples of things to include might be marketable securities that aren't drawn upon for operations, non-operating real estate. You don't see this too often, but overfunded pension plans, if they have them, they're of value and they're not part of operations. Or investments in affiliates that are not represented in the operating cash flows. So again, if they have value, you got to add them in. And then that gives you the overall enterprise value of the business. But then, before shareholders get their slice, you have to subtract the market value of debt and other obligations. So that includes short and long-term debt, underfunded pension plans, and maybe any contingent liabilities. Also, I want to go back here. Remember in our cash flows, we were really careful to keep all the financing pieces out of that? That's because we're treating all of our debt financing in one fail swoop at the end here by subtracting the market value of debt. What is the market value of debt other than the present value of all repayments of principal with interest over time? The benefit of doing it this way is every time you change your financing, you don't have to change your operating cash flows, right? That would be a total pain. So it's much easier to leave your cash flows pure operating cash flows, not including any financing, and then, as we've shown here, subtracting out all of the debt payment in one fail swoop at the end to get to shareholder value. So again, I hope you look at this and you go, easy. That's exactly what I thought it would be. <laughs> That's our intent. And the, the reason we've gone over this is we want to make sure that when you're using the, the um, M&A valuation toolkit, it's not a black box to you. And in fact, it shouldn't be. It's only doing exactly what we've just presented here. And it also does have the flexibility to use different types of cash flows and, of course, different values for the value drivers, different costs of capital. You can choose a different forecast period. Um, you, can, you can use different residual value approaches. But at this point, it should be a white box, not a black box. So you can then use this valuation analysis to explain what long-term what long-term expectations could explain um, Gleason shareholder value? And so what we've got here is if you look at Gleason's 2018 sales, you use the 10-year forecast period, and then you use the following value drivers for sales growth, profit margin, cash tax, incremental fixed and working capital, that then and, and a cost of capital that gives you a present value of cash flows a present value of residual value plus non-operating assets minus debt gives you an expected shareholder value that we see right here. And you can use, again, our toolkit to do this shareholder value work. All it's doing is exactly what we've just described. So it also can help you in what we call a seven-step process to calculate the value of transaction targets. So step one, is to enter a standalone cash forecast from the target into the toolkit. There's a worksheet in it called Standalone Target, Standalone Valuation. And in that, you simply enter the historical cash flows as well as the, the um, forecast cash flows. Then, two, you adjust that forecast for potential overstatement from the target. So if you're the buyer, you look at the forecast that came in from the target and maybe you say, uh, not sure I fully believe their sales growth or their margins or any other aspect of their valuation. So there's another sheet, which we call just the, the shareholder value sheet, which says not what's the value from the target perspective, but what's the standalone value from our perspective. So it's adjusting the standalone value. Once you've done that, you then calculate the standalone value. That's step three. Then four, you add the potential synergies to the target. You're going to see that there's two worksheets actually for synergies, which we'll show you in just a few pages. 
One of them enters the synergies, and then the other one either turns them on or off and assigns probabilities to them and all of that. So you can be very precise around what synergies you're lay layering in or not. Then six, you estimate the price you might have to pay to buy the target. And you can use the um, transaction multiples um, worksheet to do that. Or you might say, what is the value to another potential bidder? Because we know we're going to have to outbid that target. That other, um, that other potential bidder is what I meant to say. And then seven, create the value creation potential. Because the value creation potential is just the value to you minus what you might have to pay to buy it. So let me show you how you can do all of this again in the Valuation Toolkit. It ends up looking like this. So here's what we call the, the value waterfall chart, where you start with a value that comes from the target, then maybe you take a red haircut off of it to come to this, the, the, the next green bar, which is the standalone value from our perspective. And then to that, you add the value of sales synergy, the value of cost of goods sold synergies, of SG&A synergies, of investment synergies, tax synergies. And then, of course, you subtract any dis-synergies to come to the intended target synergistic value. So, with Gleason, they originally sent us this standalone forecast. Apologize for the small numbers, but you don't need to read them really. So let's assume they originally sent us this following forecast, but we said, hold it, you know, based on some due diligence, we adjusted the value drivers to get a standalone value of $551.8 million. We thought some of their investment um, numbers weren't quite right, etc. So we adjusted it to come to 551.8. Then we layered in the anticipated synergies from our synergy map. Right? We've already got the names, we've got the type of synergy, we've got the um, amounts of the synergy from our due diligence analysis, and so we simply layer them in synergy by synergy. That then results in a with synergies value all the way up at $727.7 .7 million. So there's a lot of synergies to be had in this potential deal with, with Asso Bronx. We also calculated the sensitivity of the value to each key synergy and to each value driver. What the model basically does is it turns on and turns off each synergy and sees how much the value changes as a result. This is really important because it tells you, well, okay, this synergy is worth this much money, this synergy is worth this much, etc., etc. So that if you're at the negotiating table and they say, oh, we don't believe that synergy can happen, then you can say, well, okay, well, then the value would go down by this amount. Also, on the value driver side, it's important to know how much impact each value driver has. Because I guarantee you, whatever happens at a negotiating table, they're not going to agree completely on, yeah, we think sales growth is going to be exactly the number that you do, or we think margins or taxes are going to be exactly the number. And what this analysis does is it shows for every one percentage point change in sales growth, or in margins, or in taxes, or fixed or working capital, here's what that impact is on value. So if you disagree with them, you know again how much value that impacts in the negotiations. So, adding the value created within the buyer and subtracting the transaction costs from that number leads to a total with synergies value of 737. So again, what we have in this chart is we start with our adjusted standalone value, then we add in all of the synergies one by one and the value associated with each one of them, and that gives us our with synergies value. But then we, again, um, we subtract the transaction cost to get to a total with synergies value of, in this case, $737 million. Then the next step is to estimate what we might have to pay to buy it. And as we said, the most likely scenario is, well, look, if, um, if Asso Bronx doesn't buy the company, very likely that others will buy Gleason. And so what we want to do is estimate, well, how much might another company pay for Gleason? Fortunately, it's the case here that because Bronx has a real unique profile in that it has great presence on the East Coast and none on the West Coast, and because Gleason has great presence on the West Coast and none on the East Coast, there's a really good unique fit there.
So if we subtract those unique synergies, we then end up with the value to another potential bidder in the neighborhood of $658 million. So if it's worth $737 to us, and they could probably sell for um, $600 or so million to somebody else, do you see that there's a zone of potential agreement? Right? Anywhere between those two numbers, both parties would consider themselves to be better off. They'd be doing better than they could under their alternatives. The alternative for Gleason is to sell to another company. The alternative for, for um, Asso Bronx is simply not to buy the company at all if they're paying more than it's worth to them. But again, there's a, there's a zone of potential agreement here that leads you to believe there could really be some sort of a transaction between these two companies. All they'd have to do is get into a room and settle for the difference or somewhere in between that range. So what we've done in this section is we've shown you there's various prices and values for, in this case, Gleason. And you can put them all on a value spectrum. You know, these are actual numbers that we have shown you for Gleason in this section. And notice, there's a huge number of them, right? But what I hope you've now got an awareness of is they're not all the same. And some are really right and some are really wrong, depending upon what you're using them for. Some of them are breakup values, right? That's why we have an asset value that's so low here. Some of them are transaction multiples, and you shouldn't be surprised that those tend to be toward the highs end because those include all the premiums that were paid in last transactions. But it's the two in red that have the most importance to us. Why? Because the, the, it's basically one is the value, not the price, but the value of Gleason to Asso Bronx. So they want to make sure they don't pay more, more than that, that $737 million. But then the next one is the value to the next highest bidder, which then equates to the price that Asso Bronx would need to pay to outbid them in that scenario. So the ones in red are truly the ones we want to focus on. What also bolsters that point of view is there's a lot more behind those red numbers. They're not just averages that assume away the unique synergies. No, they're specific numbers that take into account the full range of synergies that we and our operating people and our whole negotiations team and deal team think is most likely to actually occur from the transaction. A lot better to bet on those numbers than on the others here. So, if one way to state the goal of this section would be to weed through the myriad different approaches to valuation to come up with the approaches and the right inputs to give you the numbers that you can really use in your valuations to support getting a value-creating transaction. So, in summary, three different types of values and prices. We've got liquidation values and prices, we've got current, and we've got acquisition. The right one for any given company is whichever is the highest. Remember our fundamental principle. What's the highest value use for the assets? But DCF is primarily the, the most important model used for valuation because, one, it's the theoretically most pure one. It deals with cash flows, timing, and risk. Two, it's the most empirically accurate model. Three, it can be used to calculate values what it's worth to you instead of prices, what you might have to pay to, for it. And then, perhaps even most importantly, it can be used to link decisions to their impacts on value and therefore used to link the value of synergies to this specific transaction. But there are some things you need to do right in calculating um, the DCF analysis. You've got to define your operating cash flows appropriately. You've got to choose an appropriate forecast period. And you've got to choose an approach to residual value that reflects the economics of the firm going forward. And then finally, we've shown you there's a seven-step process that you can use to estimate value creation um, from a transaction. Our very next step, then, is to go back to an exercise. Let's go to the exercise where we'll look at Himalaya Dairy and go through this seven-step process to assess the value of, of Himalaya Dairy um, to both the highest potential bidder and then to potentially another bidder so that we can start to sketch out whether there's a positive zone of potential agreement for this transaction.